idea this morning that we might sing some songs, sing people into the Bible class today, as opposed to doing the normal meet and greet. And uh, that way we encourage everybody to just come on in and have a seat and then we'll get started with class. So let's let's open to song number 403. All right, let's just start. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to sing and you can sing with me if you want to and that'll be just fine. But uh, 403, song number 403, I hold to his hand. If you got a request or something like that, you just yell it out after and I'll we'll open up and try to sing number two, okay? We'll just sing some songs here for the next 10 minutes. I think we can sing for 10 minutes. What do you think? As people are coming on in, uh, we'll just sing a little bit. And do the... Forego the meat and grease. 403. Pick something you know. You don't know this one? Oh, yeah, you know what? Let's not sing it up next guy. Uh, all right. Let me change, let me change it to something else. I have a lot of good. Oh, let's do 542. Uh, 452. 452. Standing on the promise. I don't know that. Standing on the promise. All right, 452. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. come in, she's looking at us like, what in the world are y'all doing? And uh, instead of the normal meet and greet, we're going to sing some Sing Everybody In this morning. I mean, so the, the light's not on in the hall. Is that... It's, it's not is working that, right. Is, is so that, you just have to, the rest of them are. But, okay. but uh, you just go about your normal business and, and we'll be singing, and singing Everybody In this morning. So, what is it? 429. All right, let's sing 429 here. 429. Oh, to be like this. Sing the first and last. First and last. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect.
we're singing everybody in this morning, instead of doing our normal meet and greet and handshake. So that's why we're singing. Everybody in. And one of the Facebook pages does Bible jokes, you know, Christian humor type stuff that says, in, in view of all the corona scare we're going to leave out, breathe on me out of the hymns this morning. Oh, breathe on, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think we know that one anyway, but that's well, I looked it up to even see if it was in here, and I couldn't find it, so I'm sure it was just a, something to be funny with. Let's do 226. 226. Yeah, there's been a lot of jokes and humor made about the current situation. It is entertaining, at least, isn't it? Well, it sure did slow down loads and, and Home Depot yesterday because they had to go by a little gas park. And you couldn't, you couldn't park near the door. You couldn't even walk hardly in the place. Oh, they boy. Packed. Mm. What is that? Yeah, 226, first and last. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, all for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. Let, oh, I changed the words, okay, sorry. <laughs> Teach me some melodious song.
meet and greet in the back. And so we are singing songs 560. All right. And we're just come on in and have a seat. And we'll be singing a few songs here to get us started as everybody comes on in. Come on in. We're singing songs to get started this morning. Song number 560 is the next one. 560. Living by faith. We'll sing the first and the last. 560. I cannot today what the morrow may bring. If shadow of sunshine or rain. The Lord I know who live for everything. And all of my worry is pain. Living by faith.
blessings, Father, that you have given to us. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to remember those great blessings each and every day. Father, we're grateful for the presence of each person here this morning. And we're thankful that you have uh, preserved their lives to this point so that we can come together here upon the first day of the week as your people to serve and to worship you. Father, we're grateful for your son Jesus and for the sacrifice that he made on the cross that through him we can have a wonderful hope of eternal life. And, and we know, Father, that you loved us so much to send him to do that and, and that he willingly went so that we could be free from our sins. We are grateful, Father, for uh, that grace and mercy that comes through Him. And we call upon it now, asking You to forgive us of our, our wrongs. And we help, uh, we pray, Father, that You help us to resolve within our lives to put You first and to think about You as the one true and living God who controls all things and who is always in control of all things. And we we give you, Father, the, the thanks and the glory and the praise for all things. Father, we are mindful now of this study that we're doing this morning in the book of Hebrews. We are grateful for the message we are regarding your Son, Jesus the Christ, and his role as high priest. As we study these things, we pray, Father, help us to learn and to grow and to be spiritually mature so that we can be the kind of people that you want us to be so that we can be the kind of church that you want us to be. And that in doing that, Father, uh, we can reflect your great love and mercy through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of the hour. And we pray that you be with all those, Father, who are not here because of different reasons, especially those among us who are uh, suffering afflictions at this time. We ask blessings on them. Help them as they recover. And we also, Father, continue our prayers for those who have lost loved ones and who uh, continue to grieve. And we pray, Father, your blessings on each one of them. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, after all that singing, we got my all the air flowing. I won't be sharing that with you. Pass that back. So, all right. So, Hebrews chapter seven, verse eleven is where we are in our study this morning. So, let's look at verses. 11 through 19. Let's read through those verses because that constitutes a whole section here of thought that is being set forth by the writer. Therefore, in perfection, where through the Levitical priesthood were under, um, where through the Levitical priesthood were under it, the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek? and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. All right, so let's take this section of Scripture, and there's, there is a lot in these verses, in verses 11 through 19. It is 
is so dense with content. And we need to think about it, break it apart a little bit, and then understand it as a whole as well. So notice, first of all, the whole section is premised upon the idea that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the high priest now. And that has been demonstrated up to this point in the book. Chapters 1, Jesus is God. Chapter 2, Jesus is man. Chapter 3, Jesus is the perfect mediator. So he can be the perfect high priest. Okay. Now he is, he has all the qualifications. We talked about the qualifications. He has the right credentials. We talked about the credentials. And now he is the high priest. What are the implications of that? What are the implications that Jesus is high priest after the order of Melchizedek? There's no question that the scriptures teach another priesthood that would arise according to the order of Melchizedek. That's the foundation upon which this whole section is based. Psalm 110 and verse 4, right? Psalm 110 verse 4, it's quoted here in verse 17. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so this is taken from the Old Testament Scriptures. He is not setting forth in this passage a novel idea. Hey, let's change the priesthood, right? What, what If somebody were to do that, sort of on their own authority, with their own uh, thoughts, and, and just out of the blue... People would reject it, right? They would say, wait, you don't have the authority to change the priesthood. Only God has the authority to change the priesthood because the priesthood was established by God. And who are you then to say that the priesthood uh, needs to be changed? But you see, that's not what he's doing. He's not <coughs> saying it's on my authority. He's saying it's on God's authority. And where does that authority come from? Psalm 110 and verse 4. And that psalm, as we've looked at it, is a messianic psalm. And it would be instructive for us to go back and, and just look at that psalm briefly again. Psalm 110. Because the whole psalm is about Jesus as the Messiah. And so it is a, and it's only seven verses long, but let's look at it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. This is an interesting section, verses 5 through 7 there. We're not going to talk about that right now. But, just, that's the authority, you see, of the Messiah in the coming uh, kingdom of the Messiah. But, it's clear that in this psalm, David is not talking about himself. And why is that? Because David is the author of this psalm, first of all. And secondly, he says, your, you, your, over and over again. Well, who is this you and your? And, well, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. So, this is someone special. The Lord said to my Lord, this is David's Lord. And Jesus makes, I think it's in uh, Matthew chapter 22, toward the end of the chapter, Jesus uses this passage to point out who the Messiah would be. Because he uses this and he asks the question, if David calls him Lord in the Spirit, how is he David's son? Because everybody knew that the Messiah was going to be the son of David. And so Jesus puts that question to his questioners and said, I have a question for you. Okay. The Messiah is the son of David, right? And they said, oh yeah, the Messiah is going to be the son of David. 
And so Jesus says, well, how does he then in the Spirit call him Lord? How does he call him Lord? Because the Lord said to my Lord, right here. You see, so even in the first century, they knew that this psalm was messianic. There's no question that this psalm was prophet prophecy about the Messiah. Jesus didn't say, you know, when he asked that question, he didn't say, do you believe Psalm 110 is about the Messiah? Why didn't he say that? Because it was already presumed that Psalm 110 was about the Messiah. They all knew that. They all understood that. And yet, this psalm prophesies of a different priesthood. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, that's the point that the writer, the speaker of the book of Hebrews here, chapter 7, is king from. A priest forever according to the... This is a different priesthood. This is not the Levitical priesthood. He's already shown that this priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood by his argument in the beginning of chapter 7. Now, what are the implications of this? What is... Uh, what can we expect because the priesthood is, has been changed? So he says, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? So we had this scripture, Psalm 110, verse 4. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. A new priesthood is going to arise. That priesthood is going to be according to the order of Melchizedek. Why is that even necessary? If the Levitical priesthood was perfect, why was that necessary? Well, the answer is very clear, right? That the Levitical priesthood was not perfect. The word perfect means complete. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean flawless, but it does mean complete. In other words... There's something lacking there. There's something not whole about the Levitical priesthood. There's some problems with it. There's, there's some issues that can't be addressed. And the Levitical priesthood is lacking in that regard. Now he's going to talk about what these issues are in the next few chapters as he discusses the role of the priest and what the priest does. But right now, he just wants to focus on the idea that, you know what, we, we've got a different priesthood here. Uh, and, and this implies some things. So look at verse 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. The Mosaic law, right? The law of Moses. And that's when he, look at this parenthetical expression here in verse 11. For under it the people received the law. Under the Levitical priesthood the people received the law, right? So the law and the priesthood are inextricably linked together. The priest, the priesthood and the law, they go together. You cannot separate them. That's his point. The law is under the priesthood, the priesthood is under the law. They're related to one another and they are contingent or dependent on each other. Okay? So if you get rid of one, you've got to get rid of the other. Right? It's like having a uh, set of, uh, I don't know, what set of two things, right? Peanut butter jelly sandwich. There you go. If you get rid of peanut butter, you can't have a peanut butter jelly sandwich, can you? Because it's no longer, there's no more peanut butter there anymore. If you get rid of the jelly, you can't have a peanut butter jelly sandwich anymore. Because there's no jelly anymore. It takes both of them to have a peanut butter jelly sandwich. You've got to have both of them together in order to have that, that whole. And so one is tied to the other. If you remove one of the elements, you don't have the whole. That's, that's what he's saying here. And so to say that the priesthood is changed means that the law has to be changed as well. There's just no, there's no question about that. Because they are so intricately tied together. Now, who said the priesthood would be changed? Psalm 110 verse 4. 
God did. God said the priesthood would be changed. And so what does that mean? That God must also want the law to be changed as well, huh? Because God wouldn't change the priesthood without changing the law, would He? Because He's the author of it. He's the one that put it together to begin with. He's the one that gave the law of Moses to Moses. He's the one who gave the priesthood to Moses. He's the one that put the priesthood and the law together. So guess what, folks? If He changes the priesthood, then the law's got to change also. Oh, wow. That's a revolutionary thought, isn't it? Because now, what do we have? We don't have, we don't, we don't have the Mosaic Law anymore. We have something else. And if you go back to the Mosaic Law, or even in part, okay, you no longer have Jesus Christ as your high priest. And why is that? Because the Mosaic Law had a priesthood. And if you go back to the Mosaic Law, you're saying, well, I've got to have that priesthood and not the priesthood under which Christ is priest. What does that mean? It means you cut yourself off from heaven. Because that's where Christ is right now, sitting on the right hand of the throne of God and intermediating for His people. That's the role of the high priest. You don't have a high priesthood, in other words. God says the high priesthood has changed. That means the law has changed. That means you can't go back to the old law. You can't go back to the old priests. What does that mean? It means if you're a Jewish Christian, to go back to the old law is to cut yourself off from God entirely. Well, who wants to do that? I certainly don't want to do that. Do you want to do that? I hope not. But that's the, the dilemma that those who are Jewish Christians who were saying, I'm leaving Christianity, I'm going back to your law, that's the problem that they get into if they go back. Now, this section of Scripture here makes it very clear that you cannot be a Christian in the sense of, of in, in, you cannot be a Christian and a practicing Jew at the same time. When I mean practicing Jew, I'm talking about the uh, of Judaism as it was practiced by the law, of, under the law of Moses and all that. Alright? Now, obviously, a person can have a nationality. I can be a citizen of the United States and be a Christian at the same time. A person could be a citizen of Israel and be a Christian at the same time. I'm not talking about citizenship, all right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about religious practices. That's what I'm talking about, okay? So, this, these verses then exclude Judaism as a faith from Christianity. They exclude it. Judaism is excluded as a religious system of practice that God will accept. God will not accept Judaism. You cannot come and have a relationship with God through Judaism. Why? Because Christ is the high priest. And to have a relationship with God, it's got to be done through the high priest, who is Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people in this world that don't believe that. But that's what this, these verses are teaching. Priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. Verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken, he of whom these things are spoken, and that's Jesus, alright, belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So Judah, under the Mosaic law, anyone from the tribe of Judah, they were not authorized to be priests. Why is that? Because the Mosaic law said that only those who come from the tribe of Levi may be priests. And, and that's it, you know. Very clear, very simple, very understandable. So you don't have to say... Uh, in the old law, God doesn't have to say, okay, uh, tribe of Levi are priests, and 
And so therefore, Judah can't be priests, Manasseh can't be priests, uh, Ephraim can't be priests, on and on and on, on, all through the... He doesn't have to enumerate that the other 11 tribes are refused to be priests. Now it's interesting, <laughs> because if you go back and study the, the whole law, uh, you'll find that the other tribes eventually realized this, and they got to the point where they were like, hey, wait a minute, we want to be priests too. And there was a big confrontation, you know, between Moses and the rest of the people, and, and they brought their own censors, and Moses said, all right, I tell you what, let's, let's do this, let's, do this. Let's, uh, let's, you take your censors, and put, them, put fire in them, and, and the tribe of Levi will take their censor, or Aaron will take his, put fire in his, and then you send your representatives for it, and, and we'll see what God does, all right? And so when that happened, God opens the ground underneath them and swallows them alive and says, uh, only Aaron. You know, he makes it very clear. But you know, that's that's sort of man's way of trying to deal with the silence of God. Man says, oh, God's silent. Oh, that means I can do whatever I want. No, that's not right. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. It means that God has spoken. And he has given us direction. And that we are to follow that direction. We cannot do whatever we want in our relationship with God. We're not the one who controls that relationship. Okay? And to try to be in control as, as, as if to say, Lord, I'm going to control you. You're not going to control me. It does not go right when that happens. It, it shows that man is erring. And man uh, has tremendous problems when those situations take place in the Old Testament. And so we've got to subject ourselves to the Lord. He's got to be the one. Well, He is the one in control, you know, as a matter of being, His being. It's not that I give Him that control. He's already in control. Okay. And, and we've got to sit back and let Him handle it. Is what we've got to do. And we've got to respect His will in this regard. So, but that's just an aside, uh, a note here about this idea from which... Uh, Moses, the law of Moses said nothing, right? So, and that's verse 14. But he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And this is an interesting uh, section here because guess what? Uh, this writer, this speaker, yes, he was inspired of God, but also he had access to those genealogical records. And that's not such a strange thing because we have access to those genealogical records as well. They're found in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke. We can see the genealogy of, of Jesus, Joseph's lineage in Matthew, and, and what many scholars believe to be Mary's lineage in Luke. Okay, Both lineages are found so that we can see that through either one he comes from the tribe of Judah. That's very clear. And, and so... Uh, in other words, when this book was written, when it was spoken, uh, most likely, barring kind of a direct sort of uh, revelation from God, and it may have happened anyway, I'm not going to discount that, uh, but, um, you know, these, these documents that were written were circulating in the first century, and that, uh, especially the, the, the messages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were among the very first uh, uh, documents that were uh, compiled and put together by the apostles and prophets of the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit and they were then began to be circulated, okay? He has access to these things. He has access to these things, alright? And that's what that shows in part, you know, barring the, the idea that maybe he was uh, and, and it's always possible that he could have been directly inspired by God with that knowledge. That's, that's possible. But he says it is evident, it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. And evident means that anyone can, can find that information, right? Anyone can search it out. And so I think he's referring to the genealogies here. I think he's saying, yeah, Jesus has a genealogical lineage, and that lineage is from the tribe of Judah. And you can go research that and you can find it out. Um, and that's that's part of, you know, the Bible, when the Bible reveals information, there's, it, it, some of it is corroborated, uh, can be corroborated. Right? Some of it means it can be verified in time in which, 
it was written. So, for example, when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus' resurrection was seen by uh, Peter and the other apostles and uh, you know many witnesses, and then he says, and above 500 at one time, above 500, and then he says, of whom the majority of those remain alive. Right? You remember that? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through about 8, something like that. Okay? He's giving that information to people who are reading that and say, wow, there's people alive who saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And Paul said, I'm one of them, by the way. I saw him. But there's other people too out there. If you don't believe me, you go ask them. And they'll tell you. Oh yeah, hey, I saw him. After he was raised from the dead, I saw him. Talked to him. Uh, you know, communicated with him. He talked to me. Yes. There's evidence. You can go. The Bible doesn't discourage that. The Bible doesn't say, hey, don't, don't, don't try to look for evidence because you're not going to find it. The Bible says, yeah, go, go find the evidence. Go look at it. Go test it out. It's a good thing. We want people to believe the message of the gospel. And so God has given us evidence. And so that's what he's doing here. He's setting forth evidence. He's saying it's evident that our Lord arose from Judah. And you, if you have the uh, gumption to do it, you can go research that and find that out for yourself. That the evidence is available right now. Yes, sir. Am I not correct that it's a place to believe that you do not have the responsibility of pursuing the right path job by the Holy Cross? Now, the reason I say that, the right said on the front of a mountain, they can be part of the Well, I guess I wonder. good question. Um, the Bible teaches us that we are to seek God. In fact, Acts chapter 17, there when uh, the Apostle Paul was speaking to unbelievers, right, in Athens. These were not Jews, they were not Christians, they were philosophers, you know, of that day and time. And he said, and he says in that speech in Acts chapter 17, he says that we were all made, we were all created to seek God. And, and, and that's part of our constitution as a human being, that, that we're made to seek God. We have an internal desire for God. And only God's going to fulfill that desire, all right? And, and you say, well, why do some people not do that? That's the question that you're asking. And there's a lot of answers to that question, but the biggest answer is uh, prejudice. You know, prejudice on our part for something else. We have our mind already set on something else other than God, and we're going to we're going to go with that instead of seeking God. That's what we're going to do. And so prejudice plays a big role in preventing people from seeking God. If they if they have no prejudices, then I suppose that everybody would seek God. But people have prejudices, right? There's there's reasons why they do the things that they do. Uh, it happens in their childhood a lot of times, and, and the, those years are very formative, and as a result, when they become an adult, they don't see it as their responsibility then to seek God. They see it as a responsibility to do something else. And so that's, our, that's why we've got to be constantly challenging ourselves, looking at our lives, asking ourselves, you know, are, are we doing the Lord's will? Am I seeking God? Have I removed my prejudices? That kind of thing. Yes. That's right. Yes, he did. Um, that's Matthew chapter 7. That the, there's a wide gate and then there's an arrow gate, you know. And that many go in at the wide gate. And the gate that leads to destruction. The narrow gate, few, few go in at the narrow gate. Um, so, it, it, and it's a process that... Uh, starts with ourselves when we are young and when we're born, when our, in our formative years and we learn a lot of things and we take those things with us into our adulthood and we act, act them out. And a lot of those things, uh, they, they constitute our, our core beliefs, our foundational beliefs about who we are, about what the world is, 
about uh, our relationships with other people and how we are to conduct those things. And they're, they're very different for every single person. And why is that? Because every single person has different experiences during their formative years. My experiences are not the same as yours. Yours are not the same as mine. The person that's sitting next to you, it doesn't matter how close they are to you, your experiences are not the same as his or hers. You know, it's, it's, everybody's different in that regard. And so we each have to examine our own life. We've got to look at our own life and ask ourselves, what about my experiences? Are there things that happened in my childhood that are, that, that are affecting the way I'm thinking right now? And, and do those things need to be addressed or not, you know? Um, and we have a great capacity for self-rationalization as well. <laughs> and that makes it even worse, you know, because we look at our, and maybe let's say something, we, we develop the belief in our childhood that's wrong, for example. And we look at that belief and, and uh, uh, it might not be wrong in principle, but it's wrong in application, let's say, all right? And we look at that belief in principle and say, well, that's right, that's, so therefore I must be doing it right. You know? Well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, just because it's right in principle doesn't mean that we, we're doing it right in application. That, those things can be very difficult to, to sort of uh, uh, meet out, you know, to pair it out. And it's hard uh, for us as adults to know sometimes how to apply a uh, basic fundamental truth. But even then, let's say we have this belief and, and we do self-justification, you see, we come in, or self-rationalization, we come in and we say, well, now, that's what I've been taught, that must be right, and so now I'm going to hang on to that, and I'm going to defend it, all right? And I'm going to say, well, that is right, and I don't care what anybody else says, and now I've got all these reasons piled up for why it's right, all right? And then, so in addition to the, the wrong belief or the wrong application of the belief itself, we have all these rationalizations. Now we've got to go through all these rationalizations and, and expose them for what they are first, okay, so that we can get at whatever that core uh, belief is and we can then examine that. Okay, so we, we, we put up a lot of walls, a lot of barriers, a lot of defenses, and, um, and we do that um, for uh, basically one primary reason, and, and that is self-preservation, okay? Self-preservation. Because when we're young, when we're kids, guess what the number one issue is that our parents are enforcing in our mind? Self-preservation, right? Why? Because you can't take care of yourself as a child, right? And so your parents are concerned about your preservation, and so you look at that and you say, oh, the most important thing is self-preservation right now, right? And so we develop a lot of beliefs about self-preservation that then later on. You see what the gospel is teaching, you say, well, how is this relevant to the gospel? Because self-preservation is like one of the great enemies of the gospel, okay? What did Jesus say? And, and I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying it's wrong to, to, to live and have a good life and all that. But to, to make self-preservation focus and the only thing, that's the problem. That's the problem, all right? That's not the priority according to the scriptures. Self-preservation is not the priority. You say, well, how do you know that? How do you know that's not the priority? Because God says, you be faithful unto me, even if it means your death. Really? Yes. Well, what does that mean then? That means there's a priority higher than self-preservation. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. There's a priority higher than self-preservation. What is it? It's Christ. It's Jesus. It's living, really. If you make your life all about self-preservation, that's it. That's not really a very fun life. You think about it. Because then it's always going to be, well, what can I do next to ensure my survival? It's just survival at that point. That's not very fun. That's very... Uh, anxious and, and full of tension always, and you're constantly worried, you know, which direction something's going to come at you later, and, and, and how do I prevent that from happening? And boy, I don't want that. Right? And so I'm going I'm to take all these 
uh, preventative steps. I'm going to put a great barrier around my existence. And then uh, you think everything's great. And what happens? You get hit by a truck or something, right? And uh, you don't see that coming. So there's always things that we don't see coming. They're always, there's always something that threatens our, our existence, our survival. How do we deal with that as Christians? We seek the kingdom first instead. We live instead of just survive. Okay? And, and Jesus, Jesus says this. That's what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 16. Look at, look at the end of Matthew chapter 16 real quick. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Notice what he says here at the end of Matthew chapter 16. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now that, that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about trusting in him. Trusting in God to provide for us instead of us to provide for ourselves. All right? Breaking down those walls of self-preservation and living on faith in God. That's the constant challenge. That's the constant struggle. Because there's so many vectors of, of evil coming at us in so many different directions. And we can't possibly keep up with all those things. There's no way. Our, our, our minds just... We're just not intelligent enough to do that. And, and we're not intelligent enough to do that even as a species. Okay? But God is. God has so many more resources available to Him. An infinite number of resources. And He can, he can take care of us when nobody else can. And that's, that's a tremendous thing, you see. So... All of that in answer to Brother Weaver's question, you know, why, why don't people, why don't people believe the truth? Uh, why don't people see God? You know, and, and the answer is simply because uh, they're concerned with seeking themselves. That's ultimately what it boils down to. It's self versus God, and self wins out, reminds a bunch of people, because it's difficult <coughs> To put your trust in something that you can't control. Alright? That's and, and God is God, we don't control God. Okay? We do not. He is out, He is wholly out of our control. Okay? And because of that, we want to think that we've got to have it our way instead of His way. And so that's why that's why uh, faith in God can be a very difficult thing. I saw something, I'm going to get to you in a second right here, but I saw okay, something so on the internet, you know, there's a lot of things going around, but something about, uh, you know, God never encourages us to fear anything but Himself. And I think that's a good statement. Because when we fear other things than God, that's when we start getting a lot, a lot of trouble in a lot of ways. Okay, Brother Ray. Well, I think you're talking about uh, different things, but I think that I almost am not there I think there's a there's a tendency for us as humans to not seek God because we have a misconception that if we seek God, life is going to be good. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. It doesn't teach us we're going to be we're going to have food all the time because we have examples in the Bible of people like, uh, uh, famine, rich men and the poor. You know, we have examples of people that did not have a good life on this earth, but that was not what their intent. Their intent was after this life. And if we don't have a good life here, then God is letting us down. It seems like there's a there's an expectation expectation yeah. that we're going to be if we do this, we're going to have a good life. Yeah. But that's not true. No, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, false, not. it's a false. Uh, In fact, Paul says, having food and rain, let us know we right? Well, that's not very much, is it? Uh, food and clothing. That's it. That's, that's all 
God really promises while we're here. And uh, He doesn't even promise that our life is going to be extended to the point. In fact, He tells us otherwise. He says, it's a point of men wants to die. That death is a sure thing. And that we should not uh, try to avoid that the reality of that truth. Okay? Uh, we should instead uh, understand that it's coming and make proper preparation for it. All right, we got to stop, so yeah. let's quit here, and we'll pick up next week, and we'll continue our study. Now.